Welcome to the Beauties and Beasties podcast with Alex and Sean. Well, good evening. How the devil are you? I'm fine, thank you. Can you see the spot, the deliberate mistake? Uh, yeah, well, it's... your hair's fallen out and you're a sexy bastard now, so what's went on? Proper pest controller now, not just an yeah, imaginary not... one, see? Bold. Yeah, yeah. Got two real Bold pest exactly. controllers on. Yeah, well, before we go into it, I want to take a massive opportunity to say thank you very much to the UKBR, the sponsor in this whole mini series. Um, if anybody doesn't know what they are and wants to have a look into it, long and short of it, and I'm sure Jason's going to cover some of this because he's actually a member as well as me, um, it's a register of people who will take feral colonies out of your building. They're independent, um, and it's a great place to go if you have any questions, so please feel free to um, give their page a like, get in touch with them. It would be massive, massive. Um, Mandy Hagar was again the first person to say hello, hello. So well done. Yeah. Niall Gallagher, I'm not talking to him because he's horrible to us all the time. Alex looks different this week. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good. Good, yeah. Wayne Gardner, good good evening. Um, yeah, how's your week been, you? Oh, not too bad. Not too bad. We've been ticking along. Lads have been out working hard, um, pulling it together. So, yeah, not a bad week. How's the world been with you? Um, oh, do you know, I've just had one of them weeks, I'm sure. I don't, I don't know if everybody else gets them or what, but I've got nothing to complain about. Everything's going well, um, better than well. But, you know, when you just get to a point where you're like, like you just can't put your finger on it. I don't That's know whether it's lack of sleep. Um, they're up there. I've turned them around because I've got details on them, but that was a, um, yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, um, I always say when you get lost when a mountain of work start at the start and end at the end, you know, it's a great, it's always dug us out the shit, that philosophy. And um, But now I've got like three starts. I don't know how to start. So I went and bought some whiteboards, wrote stuff on there, and that has helped, but I've still not got over that. I don't know what it is. I, I do it every now and again. I'll snap out of it in no time. But at the minute, I'm just like waiting. I kind of put me. No, I, I don't know what it is, mate. I just can't put my finger on it. Um, it's probably things on my mind that I'm not. I don't, I don't know. But anyways, that's enough for me. Um, tell us about something good and something bad that's happened to you this. Actually, tell us. Uh, tell us why you're here. Me, I'm here because Alex has gone away to train some people. And right. um, I've been asked to step in because I normally hide behind the screen um, yeah. and do other things. But uh, that's why I'm here, because Alex is away. But yeah, I'm, I believe he's in Edinburgh? Somewhere past Bristol. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all, it's all north, north from there, isn't it? Yeah, north uh, of the wall. You know, any, yeah, north anywhere. Of the wall, yeah. yeah, past Bristol. No, I, I might be wrong. He might shout as is for getting this wrong, but I think he's in Edinburgh doing a level two course for BPC, RSPH, whatever it is. He's doing one of the big ones, um, I think. And he's, I think he's had a good bunch by all accounts. I spoke to him midweek, and he said that they were a right good bunch, and they were getting stuck in and trying hard. So maybe some more good pest controllers coming through. You know. Good. We always we always say there's not enough pest controllers and there's not enough young blood and blah blah blah, but I tell you what, there's, there's always level two courses which are full, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, and there seems to be ever an increase. I don't know what the uh, statistics are, but that there seems to be an ever growing <laughs> amount of courses that are available for level two. You know, it used to be that there only appeared to be four courses per year. Um, and you'd have to travel absolutely miles to do one. But now they seem to be dotted all over the place. 
I was speaking to David Helgelson at um, PestX, and I believe they're starting to offer training now, aren't they? I think Pest Fix R, Pelsis R, Kill Gym clearly do. That I've done for a long time. NPTA, do they offer level two? Uh, don't think so. I don't know. B BPCA certainly offer it. And then you've got Alex's yeah, IPM Central. I IPMC, that's offering level two, but that's a different sort of setup isn't it for those who don't want to do the week or whatever it is that's one of our uh, chaps did, and found it very useful actually oh did he yeah because we did, you did a set of evenings online and then you did the um you did two days in the classroom so okay let me sit there i um, don't know yeah so yeah he found that quite useful Ah, there he is, Lex. But I think that's enough of us. Let's. There's yep. some really interesting um, news come out about Asian Hornets literally before we are coming live. And we have a guy called Jason Arms. He's all over Facebook. He's pretty good with social media. Um, so he better not let us down as I'm going to burn his house down with his family in. So come on, Jason, no pressure. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, now I feel... Now I feel pressured. Nice one. Um, Pressure's good on. <laughs> good evening all. Yeah, very nervous because it's a live stream. Um, I don't know if you some of them. No, nobody watches us anyway. So uh, what? Nobody watches uh, anyway, so I shouldn't worry. No, no, no. Um, well, yeah, I don't know if anyone seen my videos. Um, yeah, they're all pre-recorded, so it's easier. <laughs> but anyway, uh, introductions, I suppose. Yeah, Jason Arms. I run Arms Aprys, um, beekeeper initially. Specialising in the removal of feral established colonies of honeybees uh, from properties, commercial and residential. Um, yeah, gone full time with the bees last year. Left my previous job. Um, went full time with it. I've only been a beekeeper for four years. In fact, only started in 2020. But I wasn't one of the ones that started because of uh, COVID. I started before COVID. Uh, but whilst I was doing my beekeeping course, COVID kicked in and closed it all down. Um, but still carried on. I had an opportunity to have bees on a farm in Rootham, down here in Kent. Um, yeah, so carried it on from there. And then from in four years, I've gone from one hive to just under 30. And yeah, running a small business, um, when the main part of it is, is, is the removal of established colonies, um, which is great, fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant job. Um, Where are so, yeah. We're obviously Sorry. more than happy for people to give a shout out and UKBR sponsoring this. I'm a member, but it's pointless me telling people because everyone thinks yeah. I'm sort of. Yeah. yeah, so go on, tell them a little bit about that, how it works. I'm not Sorry. a member. Oh, stop. I'm not a member and I'm not a beekeeper, so I'll put my hands in the air. All right, fair enough. We're not, we're not all some of them. Anyway, so UKBR, yeah, uh, nationwide group of bee removers. Um, all part of the same association, all trained, fully insured. Um, it's a bit like Checker Jade, really. Um, so any customers that do have feral colonies, um, or should I not mention that name? Um, anyone who's got feral colony can be safe assured that people that the UKBR are recommending are yeah, a fully experienced and insured to do the kind of work that a normal beekeeper is not insured to. Um, standard beekeeper is only insured up to three metres to collect a swarm. It's certainly not insured to um, remove the fabric of a building to gain access to a colony. Um, so, yeah, um, there's quite a few members. I can't remember how many have joined this year. Um, but, yeah, it covers nationwide. I think there's only a handful of us down here in the southeast, which is great, which is how I've, you know, come to expand my business in such a short period of time, I believe. Um, yeah. yeah, I cover mainly Kent, Sussex, Surrey, and Essex. So yeah, cover quite quite a few counties at least. Anyway, um, go on. So, so um, I've got to say for us, um, because we we've been doing it quite a long time. Previously, you know, sort of 25, 20, 25 years ago, um, I'll stick my hands in the air and say, you know, we've killed our fair few colonies of bees. You know, we've we've tipped a fair old bit of insecticide down people's chimneys in the past. Um, but then 
once we realized this was not quite the way to go, um, we would start handing, st trying to hand, hand stuff over to beekeepers. And around where we are, no, nobody was interested in getting up onto a chimney to start taking um, bees out of chimneys or bees out of buildings. So we didn't really have any option. Um, but once the UK BR started um, and Clive gave his talks at the various pest control uh, association meetings, we at least had somewhere where we could genuinely pass on to customers that were phoning up. And we felt like we'd done our bit, you know, we'd helped the customer out, we'd given them a reliable, and we knew that if it was going to go to the UKBR, then they would get a sensible answer and a reliable uh, contractor to do the work. So we could actually put our name behind it. Nobody was going to phone up and say, <laughs> you, you mentioned. So it's been really useful to us as pest controllers and not beekeepers to be able to say, this is who you've got to ring. Mm. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it gives the person a couple of confidence knowing that the people that are going to come around to basically take their property apart um, are fully confident and competent in doing what they do. Because I personally wouldn't like Tom, Dick, and Harry turning up with a sledgehammer, a chainsaw, and a pickaxe to take a colony of bees out of my property. So, um, but yeah, I think that a lot of things have shifted, you know, people's mindsets in especially saving bees over the last five years or so have changed that they want to do the best they can and help save you know insects and bees bees specifically um because at the end of the day yeah people people are happy to pay a pest controller to kill a wasp nest but they don't realize you know and obviously the realization is that bees are better better pollinators than what wasps are um so yeah it's good it's nice being part of it i've been part of it I say, even though I've been doing beekeeping since 2020, um, I think I did my first removal in 2021, which is a friend's house. So it wasn't too bad if it all went peak tong because um, it was a friend's house. But yeah, since then, um, yeah, being part of the UK beyond, you know, helped go do some of the trade stands and promoting the safe, ethical, ethical removal of the colon, you know, colonies of honeybees. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is obviously going to be a better option uh, than using using pesticides. Um, so, because yeah. so, what's your what's your hopes for the future with your business? What do you want to do? What do you want to go? Where do you want to take it? I don't want to take it too big, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, I've got thirty colonies at the moment, so if I could double that, I think that's quite a substantial amount um, as a small time, I don't know, I suppose, a commercial beekeeper. Um, but yeah, with the bee removals, it's just I love it. I enjoy doing the bee removal so much that it's, it's become, you know, a good percentage of my income for my business. And yeah, just progressing that. I've got other avenues that are actually in the process of being sorted out now, uh, in regards to the unit. Because where I've only done a short period of time doing it all at home, honey extraction, that kind of thing. The wife's not very happy about it. The amount of honey that goes through the kitchen. Um, Obviously, with bee removals, the amount of wax comb that gets produced uh, comes, you know, as a byproduct. So rendering that down and making candles. I love making candles. Um, doing that all in the kitchen, yeah, it's complete. I would say it ball lake with a wife and the year old. So um, I'm expanding to a unit this year. Um, that should be, yeah, within the next few weeks being confirmed. Um, it's a local unit, um, historical unit as well. I won't say any more than that. Um, but yeah, so expanding into small a small beekeeping business that's not just bees and removals, but equipment and all sorts um, and things like that. Also, do beekeeping experiences, which is which is does pretty well. To be honest, um, a lot of people are interested in getting involved with bees and seeing bees and getting up close without having the hassle managing bees. Is is yes, yeah, becoming very uh, popular. So. Um, but yeah, just building up to a nice substantial size that, um, yeah, pays the bills at the end of the day, but I enjoy doing it. Yeah, I mean, my previous job that I gave up was a mechanical engineer, so going into a workshop every day, um, yeah, it was got a bit boring and tedious. A bit after a while. Yeah, it was. You took, I would, yeah, so mechanical engineer, so I used to do CNC machining, 
uh, while I still do CNC machining. Fortunately, uh, I have a skill set that I can go back to over the winter time when the bees, there's no real bee season. So, um, can you CNC a hive? CNC a hive nurse, computerized numerical control. Um, so yeah, making yeah, but making can you see and see? Could you see and see a hive, hive frame yeah. out? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, can do. Um, a lot of the frames we buy these days, and you know, the wooden hives, they to a degree, they've all been CNC'd and machined to to a degree. So yeah, you could do. Which is the trendy um, one that you slot together? The trendy hive, like like the igloo for the for chickens. Oh, that's, that's um, a bee hoose, is it? Is that the bee hoose? I think. I don't know. I've seen it. Anyway. Yeah, I don't, don't agree with plastic. It's, plastic is it hives, a beehive but... from Ikea, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Um, so, yeah, going from machining to bee, beekeeping, I think it's um, two worlds apart. But, yeah, always strive to do something to get away from working in a workshop anyway. And, yeah, working with nature certainly is a... Uh, Certainly done that without a doubt. Um, what was that? Since you know, I've made some fantastic stuff. Done a lot of work for top F1 teams: McLaren, Mercedes, Red Bull, Haas. Yes, um, made stuff for Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, stuff for films. Yeah, so it is some really interesting stuff. Um, I would bore you with some pictures, but I'm sure you don't want to. Um, but yeah, it's good. But yeah, two worlds apart. Yeah. So. First of all, I don't know why, but it screams out to me that you should be CNC and brood boxes and making some money off them. You've got the skill, you've got the thing. I don't know why it just screams out to me that that opportunity is there for you. Um, I did have my own CNC machines because I had a small um, business making like um, plaques and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, there's always the opportunity in the, in the unit that I have to have my own little CNC machines producing stuff. Um, got the technology got the know-how so yeah, yeah. You never know i see an arms apri hive on on the market one day may do yeah but we are here to talk about the dreaded asian hornets here yes are we hearing Come on, then. bad news this week we're we here well at the moment we're up to four four confirmed sightings um yeah so it's that jumped quite quickly yeah, it did. It's not looking very good, should I say. Um, I say the last last sightings confirmed in the last, well, 20th and 21st. Um, we've got Preston in Lancashire and Romford in East London. So the one in Romford um, was apparently dead. But the one in Preston was, that's the one, yeah, the one in Preston was apparently found in a warehouse where a lot of vehicles come from France. Um, so I don't know if that's coincidental. But um, after the MBU's speech at Pestex that I went to last week, because, um, yeah, did I say that I do pest control as well? Uh, anything that flies and stings, basically. Uh, don't deal with rats or fleas and bed bugs and all that, my larky. Um, so I didn't list, I didn't go to Pestex. So as you um, were at the NBU talk, can you give us a quick, Synopsis. So Nigel, Nigel Sennett, he gave, gave quite a quick, brief, um, it was brief and quick, um, situation debrief, I suppose, to all the, the pest controllers up there. Um, he rushed through quite a lot. He's basically saying that the, the, the high increase in the southeast was due to, oh, I've got pictures saved somewhere, um, the high pop, the high density population in the north of France, so i.e., Asian hornets flying over this year um, and their ability to latch onto vehicles coming over on the ferries and stuff like that. And when I asked him, um, is it the possibility that we've got a high increase in the southeast due to missed nests from last year? Um, yeah, he basically denied it. Or he said we can neither confirm or deny that the high increase is due to Asian hornet nests missed in 2022. So, um, yeah, um, I think it goes without saying that I don't think we had an influx because everyone's flying over the coast. You know, yeah, it is close and we've had some, you know, we've, we've had one photograph last year on a car or a caravan. But, yeah, I don't think it's not all the increase last year was due to 
pitch archers. Yeah, they say, don't know that in um, Jersey and France, that the vast majority of nests, I believe, are reported by members of the public and not by beekeepers, mm -hmm. where at the moment our beekeepers are finding them, which probably means that the members of the public are missing them. I would say that, you know, the percentages are probably the same. It's just, and I think, it, you know, they just don't want to say it to them. But the MBU have asked, they've been asked to, did you send the email to the MBU, Hugh? I did. What, what was, what, to remind us, what happened with that again? Nothing. They didn't bother to reply back. So who, so, but they were, but they was, did, I say we, the Royal We, didn't you send it to absolutely everybody there? Uh, all five contacts that we've got at the MBU, chair, Chairman, um, Nigel Simmons, um, I've got the list. There's about five or six contacts that we had on the contacts list, and we emailed all of them to ask them if they would come onto the podcast. We didn't even, we weren't graced with a reply, should I say. I don't, anyways, it's Jason's, oh, I just find it frustrating because I can turn up a Pestex and give a, a talk to 50 pest controllers, but they can't come on you and reach a, a whole lot more, you know, I just find it frustrating, really, really frustrating, but let's not dwell on the negatives, let's look at the positive, tell us about last year, Jason, what did you see, what did you not see, what did you hear? Right, well, so for, for most of the year, um, yeah, I don't. I I personally don't recall hearing much on Asian hornets. Um, it got to the end of July, beginning of August or middle of August. That's when the major reports were coming out of um, colonies being lost to Asian hornets down in Folkestone. Um, and then after that, it just seemed one nest after another was being found and destroyed. And then before I knew it, uh, I'm within you know five five miles of three or four nest beams were destroyed in Maystone. Uh, one of those was literally within, I mean, as the crow flies, within a mile of my apiary up in Detlin. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it, it was just, how can you go from a few individual sightings the previous year and, you know, a, f a few nests destroyed to having that many, 72 in such a short period of time? Um, yeah, it just seemed, it, it just seemed infathomable. Um, and all of a sudden, it was just, yeah, lack of information coming out, lack of being able to help and getting involved in it. Um, it just seemed to be trying to get involved in a secret fraternity, um, you know. To, well, go on, go on, tell me about that then. So I'd, you've got to remember, I don't know anything about this sort of side of it really. So what? explain the processes and what happened down there. Um, well, basically, I mean, uh, we, the, the ones near us, you know, beekeepers found them. Um, and it was, the MBU was notified. And then once the MBU is notified, you don't hear anything until after the nest has been destroyed. Um, so, and then they give you, so say for instance, we're told there's a nest being found in Maystone. Now, Maystone's a big area, um, 200 square kilometres or something like that. Um, Jason, can I ask something? You said you were told. Who were you told by? Uh, these these are alerts through, um, I think it was eventually through B-Base. Um, MBU release them to BBKA and then you get them through. You know, I mean, by that time, we'd set up Asian Hornets. Wow. Other people would say Asian Hornet WhatsApp groups. So, notifications yeah. coming to those. Um, it's all over the place, pretty much like it is now. So, as I say, according to the pest specific contingency plan, um, I'll say this is you can download this for the yellow legged Asian Hornet. Um, it's not a secret document that will explode in a minute. Um, so part of the notification <laughs> is similar to it. BB, BBKA, um, beekeepers will know that if EFB is reported within a kilometre and a half of their apiary, they'll get a notification from the base email. Um, but as far as I'm aware, I didn't receive any notification um, of any of these. So it says apiaries within 20 kilometres will be notified from base alerts. Um, additional locate, uh, association agent hall coordinates will be made aware, encouraged to monitor. So, but when they give you an area of, you know, a few hundred square kilometres, it's like, well, where are you going to go? And then they, they try and bring it a little bit closer. Um, but it's still quite a wide area. Um, and then registered beekeepers within the five kilometre area, as identified in the NBU's database, uh, will be supplied with suitable tracks to deploy in their apiaries. And these are traps supplied by DEFRA or by the MBU, but that never happened. Um, 
So which which traps would they supply? Do we know? No, it doesn't it doesn't say. But obviously, in the beginning, it was any kind of trap that you could stick in, stick out, and not worry about. But then, obviously, the bycatch um, concern was um, not going for non-target species. Um, so everyone, I've got some traps here. Um, let me show you a few. Um, so obviously, people know of the standard yellow one. You can pick these up thorns. Um, so these are kill traps. Basically, anything goes in it but can't get out of it. Um, so you pick these up for thorns for like seven or eight pounds. They're quite expensive for a plastic cup. Um, but yeah, you think at the end of the day, we're not, we're not aiming for, we want, don't get the target species, but come the end of the season, we want those target species, i.e. the wasps, because the wasps are destroying, destroying our hives. I lost three hives to wasps last year, even in late December. So... Um, and the, but that's come quite expensive when you've got thousands of beekeepers going out and spending a lot of money on a plastic cup, it becomes very expensive um, to eradicate this or sort of deal with this situation. So, someone come up with a genius one that of a slushy cup with a bit of 25 mil ducting in it, um, did similar 20p or something less than that. It came out, eh? but obviously, it's still a um, kill trap, yeah. nothing to get something to get in it, but nothing to get out of it. So the idea of the ducting or the bit of conduit at the end was that Asian Hornet can go in it, but being 25 mil, it can't spread its wings and fly back out again. Um, and it can't climb back out. But that becomes a kill trap again. So obviously the bycatch then becomes another issue. But people were putting 7 mil holes in it to let any bycatch back out. But obviously Asian Hornets can't get out of it then, which is ideal. Um, and then obviously... One of the best traps on the market, I will say that. I'm not affiliated, I'm not earning money from it, but it's going to have to be the guard apis. Um, this is ideal for releasing bycatch. Basically, as Sean will know this, that's just basically a queen excluder. It's even got Nikot written on the top of it. Basically, a queen excluder wrapped up with two um, moulded cones on the ends. Um, but yeah, and the little tray sits in the middle. You see that now. Little see when when, when when we talk about bycatch, when you do wasp trapping as such, you don't get that much. You don't appear appear to get that much bycatch. You know, we put l hundreds of wasp bane traps out and wasp wasp bins, and you don't appear to get much else than wasps in there. So I'm, I'm wondering. I don't, I don't know what the wasp bane ones are, but I know the wasp traps that I use. Um, I thought I had one up here. Um, it's like a, an orange thing. The dome. Yeah, the other stuff yeah. out. It flies out and stuff like that. And the attractant you're using only really attracts wasps. Um, mm. And at the end of the day, as I say, the bycatch that we're trying to avoid now becomes the target species at the end of the season for beekeepers anyway. Um, and then so you're casting the bycatch as queen wasps then? Wasps, yeah. Obviously, fair enough. You've got your moths, you've got your flies um, that people don't want those caught. And moths and that, I can understand. Um, so I'm out. But yes, the queen wasp. But there's beekeepers now that specifically put wasp, uh, wasp traps out this time of year to catch the queen wasps in the areas of their hives because they don't want those wasp nests around, which is understandable because they say, yeah, Maybe there's a lot of people people out there that don't understand. We do lead, as beekeepers, we lose um, hives um, to wasps. Yeah, Clive, as the red cap on the end. So with these, the good thing about these is they are designed, the cap on the end is, so we've got the red cap is specifically designed, so it comes off the room, let's get it in the camera, specifically designed to catch queens. Yeah, so when we're queen, queen trapping, you put the red cap on um, because it's eight mil, I believe it is. Let me just read that in there. Yeah, the red's eight mil, so that's queen trapping, spring and autumn time. So the queen's because the queen's a little bit bigger, they can get in there. And then during the during the middle of the season, when the workers are out, you change it to an orange one, which is seven mil. 
um, so it's a little bit smaller. Um, so because yeah, during the season you want to keep there's only workers around the queens won't be flying. So that's 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 a good thing about this trap is that you can it's selective. You can go for your queens and you go for your workers. Um, because this time of year there are no workers flying around, so we just want to catch queens. I suppose um, the thing about us for wasp traps is um we are actively encouraged specifically with wasp bay not to put um wasp bane and and wasp traps out until wasps become nuisance feeding so as the next nests start to break down and they start to become sweet feeders so we don't mm. we are encouraged not to actively put them out early in the season yeah it's understandable um but yeah i know there's quite a few beekeepers that actually actively trap queen wasps i do i do and i'll tell you straight i do it doesn't bother me in the slightest yeah you know yeah, i've got exactly. no issues I can't, I can't understand how I can go out and kill 300 wasp nests in a year and then complain because I've tried to catch a handful of queens or kill however many cluster flies or blue bottles or green bottles in the course of my everyday job. And then when I put the risk of, catch, of bycatch against the risk of not catching a queen um, Asian hornet, the, the bycatch argument from me goes out the window. You know, um, and I don't have time to go and check them every day. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I mean, come the end of last year, say I lost a colony two weeks before before Christmas to wasps. It was just inundated with wasps. And that's like the beginning of December. It's just ridiculous. You know, I mean, it's such yeah. a late season. And yeah, the, the traps before that are full of them. Two, three hundred deep of wasps. Yeah. You know, so the predating on the honeybees. So this year, when will, will you be looking, or will or will you be looking at putting Asian hornet traps out? I've got traps when? Out. when? You've no. got them out now. I've got them out. So, now. Yep. so for thirty hives, how many traps would you be putting out? Um, I've got five of these God Apis ones um, at each location. So I've got five apiaries. So they've got these out at the moment. Um, and how much and are they? Got, sorry? How much would they cost each? These, these are yeah. now £26, I think, each. But £125 pound per apiary. But I, when I purchased them, they were a lot cheaper. They were seven quid cheaper when I purchased these. And I purchased one, put a picture up. Next thing I know, there's lots of people purchasing them. So the price has gone up. But... Um, surprise, surprise. Yes. Um... But I don't think it, it wasn't purely. But the thing is, when you come to beekeeping associations, like um, I understand that, um, oh, I've got the name of it now, it's in the southwest, they purchased 1,500 of these to give out to all their association members. Oh. Are, the backers. Um, but if you purchase more than 100 or 200, the price drastically reduces to about 16 quid. Um, so the more you buy, because the cheaper it becomes which is yeah i mean there's a lot of a lot of beekeepers out there that want to do that and they they wanted to do some buy catch um so yeah it's it's a good trap and i say you, you come with a little comes a little dish that you put trap it in curry sauce in yeah a little yeah. sauce up. so has there been any coordination regarding like placement of traps or is it something that has been coordinated on ways of putting them, ways on putting them? Because I know often um, the Asian hornets' nests that are found are found nowhere near managed colonies, although they're often in. So has anyone, or has it just been left up to the individual beekeeper to buy them and put them out and cross the fingers and hope for the best? There was Pretty a bit of an argument yeah. last week, well, wasn't there? You say that, yeah. down in Dover and Folkestone, um, they've actually, you see, I think... The NBU or BBK have released the thing that they've they've actually done a grid reference every kilometer they put a trap across. Yeah, but it, so who, who's responsible for that? Is that the MBU or DEFRA? Is that the yeah, BBK that's, who's that's done that? Uh, Dover and folks from Beekeeping Association, I believe, has, has dealt with that. It's not, but yeah, it's BBK haven't sorted out. Um, the MBU haven't sorted that out. That's purely down to individual beekeeping associations. Um, yeah, the MBU don't get in, involved with the trapping. They just say, when we found a nest, put some traps out. Um, they'll put their own traps out. Um, that's about it. Um, a 
And so we'll say another another track that they've got as well. It's called uh, Jabber Pro. Um, basically, it's a plastic flat pack thing that's designed. You put it in a box. Um, this obviously has got fire catch to it as well. I don't know if you can see that picture very well. That's the one yeah. Trevor was talking about yeah. last week. I think he's, he's got, got a couple of them out, doesn't he? You've got a bait tray at the bottom. Um, these these are probably more ideal. They, they will catch queens in that, but they're more ideal if your honey if your colonies are being predated on by a lot of a lot of Asian hornets. These will catch a lot of Asian hornets. You'll catch hundreds of thousands in these probably, depending on what size box you use. But these are, I think these are 25, 30 quid. It comes as a flat pack. You build it yourself and then create the box yourself. Um, so yeah, there's, multi, there's many variations around. Um, a lot of people are 3D printing um, track needs to go on jars and all sorts. So um, yeah, there's lots, lots available. Um, so again, where, where, where were we? Where were we saying that that you know? You're putting them on top of your hives. You're putting them because the last week I noticed that some people were saying they're putting them on the top of the hive. Some people say they're putting them away from the hive. Where will you be putting them? Well, uh, mine are just local, local to the, my apiaries. I mean, some people say don't put them in your apiaries because you're attracting Asian hornets to your apiaries. But this time of year, when the queens are out looking for a sugary, they could be anywhere. Um, you know, the queens won't be predating on honeybees. Um, they're just looking for a sugary feed to build themselves up and build the nest up. So yeah, I've got mine in my apiaries, um, scattered around. I've got them in my gardens. You know, I mean, one of my locations, 80 acres of woodland, um, scattered around through the woodland, um, just pretty much anywhere. Um, general public can put one up in the gardens, anywhere. Because at the end of the day, these, these queens can be anywhere. Um, once they emerge from a, from a nest, they can fly. I think it was after resting maybe 40 50 kilometers so they could be anywhere you know the one that oh, found in, the one found in Axe was five miles from a nest that was destroyed last year so you know there's no specific place just put tra put traps out wherever you can um because yeah you, you they could be hiding hibernating anywhere else um i was down in uh horsham yesterday um chimney colony up on the school down that way so i was high up on the roof 10 meters up in the air lifted up some tiles there's a queen queen wasp um sitting there hibernating still asleep so these things these, it could be anywhere as i say because they're all still part of the same vespa family they're going to do the same things that this is it so far found in the edge of built up areas yeah they are um that's because the people are there to see them Queens are anywhere to so put traps anywhere. Um, the, the, the this this point Neil Bond makes a point here. Most of the nests found so far have been on the edge of build-up areas, from my understanding, and this is the reason why I believe we've lost the fight now. Because if you think about, like as a pest controller, if you think about where you kill most of your wasp nests, where you're called to, it's the same place that the finding Asian hornets. But that's not to say that's where the majority of them are. We know that the majority of wasp nests are in the countryside or miles away. We just never get called to them. And was the it, fact was, that these are getting found here tells me that we've got a lot more than we ever planned on having here. Was it Siri Ann that said that um, she, she, I'm sure in the podcast previously, she gave some, was it her that gave some figures out? You know that for every square mile there's probably two thousand wasp nests or something ridiculous and bearing in mind like as a pest control company we only did 300 wasp nests last year in a 20 mile 30 mile radius there must have been but going by that there must have been tens of thousands of wasp nests in that same area but we only got yeah. to do 300 so yeah and that's and yeah. they were all and and again, like pe as pest controllers, we don't get called to a wasp nest that's that's in the middle of a field. It's always in somebody's house because that's what's being noticed. And I don't yeah. think that there are many people that think to themselves, I'm a bit bored today, think I'll go for a walk in the fields and look for some Asian hornets. Yeah, mate, do you know what it is? I live, I live in a built-up area. I think I'm going to put an Asian hornet trap in my garden. No one's going to do that. It's not like feeding the birds, is it? 
not going to, like, there's only a handful of people going to do it, so the rest get missed, don't they? Yeah. No, they've, they've got to have something invested, haven't they? Well, yeah, but it's, it's you know, you take Jersey's approach, you know, I mean, most of the people that find the spot necessary in Jersey are locals. They're not beekeepers. They're volunteer yeah. locals. So, you know, but it's getting, it's getting the public on board. Um, you know, if more and more people are looking to save bees, um, let's see exactly. John. So do um, people, well, sorry, more and more people are looking to save bees, and you know, since, especially since COVID, people are getting out in nature and you know, all tree huggers and stuff like that. So, if you ask someone to put a, a, a trap in their garden, just keep an eye on it, look on it every now and again. It's, uh, it's not do you much. think? Do you think, though, that in that if that's the case, do you think that the message is getting over to Joe Public enough? Considering when you, you know you've only got to put up a post about save the bees, just like um, Friends of the Earth put put up a post about nicotinoid um, insecticides killing bees off. If they were just to put up a post saying, "Look, save our bees," put out an Asian hornet's trap that message would get over to Joe Public because um, I don't think that that message is getting over to the man in the street properly. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, when you look at the, the major population, it's probably not, but, yeah, I mean, the BBKR are doing a lot for promoting it. Um, a lot of beekeeping associations are doing their own thing for promoting it. You know, yeah, when are I they promoting it? Are they, they're promoting it, aren't they? The BBKA appear to be promoting it. Not having to go at them in any way, but they seem to be a... Take notice. Say again? Are people actually taking notice of it? No, they are promoting it to beekeepers. They're not promoting it to the public. Or I don't they're think... Putting they, back, uh, they're putting it on the back of a bus. They're um, not promoting the beekeepers. Hey, beekeepers know about it. Why, why are you promoting to us? to keep an eye out for us. Yeah. The point of putting adverts on the back of buses is so the general public see it. You know, we go out and put posters. Um, I say, I do craft fairs. I talk to people about Asian hornets to bring them out, okay. awareness to it. Um, but again, again, without butting in, sorry, I'm butting in. Again, right. though, I see posts from Greenpeace on Facebook about nicotinoid insecticides. I don't see anything from the BBKA just randomly popping up on my Facebook page. Uh, you do know, you know what it is, though? I don't stand up for anybody, but, but, they, this, they, I've got one complaint with the BBK, one complaint. They're the fucking punching bag for something that they shouldn't be the punching bag for. And everybody's saying, what are the BBK doing? What are they doing? What are they doing? What they forget is the BBK is funded by a group of people between 40 and 60 year old who pay their subs every month and who are massively invested. We have a government, we have a government department who put in, how, how much did they put in to getting rid of foot and mouth? Milli billions. And billions. And wasted billions. Billions. And then you've got them having a, a plan there that Jason's just read out saying, we should have traps, we should have this, we should have that. I never got no notifications last year. There's one down the road. In fact, when I rang up to ask, I was told in pretty much to fuck off like actually that's that's wrong but i was told that our help wasn't needed and you're like all right no bother but the bbk are putting the posts on you never see a post from the mbu you never see a post from defra you never see any of that and the bbk are, are being the punching bag for the mbu and they're getting they're getting shot um there you go the neil bond the government spent about two grand per head to kill badgers to remove um bovine tuberculosis like what, what like on a serious note we've got an invasive species that's coming in that's massive news like what have the mbu or what has defra or whatever done that you've seen jason that's been positive like and i, I don't want to take away from the fact that they are killing the asian hornet's nest but in a proactive manner what have the what have you seen them do well yeah apart from putting more people on the ground it's as as a governmental department not a huge amount um yeah a lot of awareness and promotion comes from the bbka but not necessarily from the mbu i don't see it as um maybe wrong maybe looking at wrong places but i mean publicity programs going on for locations yeah see a lot you get have a lot more you know promotion of it and awareness from it from local 
beekeeping associations than you will um, definitely from the MBU. Um, I suppose that's a bit unfair of me for the BBKA because as a non-beekeeper, um, I don't really know Hugh, who they are. Hugh, this is, i tell you what happened last year and Jason might, uh, tell, tell us if you had a similar experience or not. I was under the impression that what was happening was that the BBKA were hand in hand in glove with the MBU. They were doing the tracking and tracing. It was like all hands to the deck. And they were putting the posts out and everything was going tickety-boo. And they were like as entwined with them. And then when I started doing some digging, I, and I, I'll be honest, I was a little bit harsh on BBKA on the posts because I thought they were responsible for it. Then when I'd done some digging after we had them up this way, and I can't remember who I spoke to, but it was down your way. And I said, oh, no, no, no. The MBU won't tell you anything. They won't get involved. They won't do anything. But they see, were... Like, see, I remember that. I said, to, I think I spoke to you about the situation down here in the southeast. And you're like, oh, beekeepers are trying to glorify it and look after it and deal with the situation. And I said to you, it's not the beekeepers that are doing it. It's the MBU. Oh, that was it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, said it. yeah. Two weeks later, I think it was, because I think there's... Because we was up at the MPTA with the UKPR, weren't we? Um, and I said yeah. to you that it wasn't. Um, it was the MBU that are dealing with the situation that are blocking everyone out from helping. Um, and then, yeah, I'm sure it was a couple of weeks later that one in Yarm came into effect. You offered your services and you learnt yourself that what I said to you was true. But yeah. yeah, it wasn't the beekeepers that are looking for the glorification of controlling the situation because even the beekeepers were being kept out of it. It was all the MBU. So. Going forward, what would you like to see happen? Um, definitely more involvement from local associations with definitely track and trace. You know, I, I have the uh, I say privilege of attending a track and trace scenario down this way with the MBU. I mean, I'm not going to say, I have to say that individual bee inspectors perfect they're doing their job they're doing what they're doing as much as possible they can but yeah. when i say the mbu i say the mbu as a governmental department has its own mm -hmm. issues so obviously uh, um yes yeah, so there's a nest down in canterbury that's found but that was that was nowhere near built up areas that was a woodland woodland area you had you i was driving three four five miles into nothing that's fields and woodland um to meet some of them the members um and help out with a bit of track and tracing. Um, I got to speak to a couple, a couple of guys that are doing the tracking and tracing. Um, so yeah, being involved more. I think the beekeepers. It's all very well us running around putting out traps, but being involved more with the tracking and tracing, I think that's where it needs to go. Because at the end of the day, the more people on the ground looking for these things, the better it will be. When you've got the likes of so what. I went there, there were six there were six bee inspectors all looking for nests. They were tracking two lines, two lines of flight lines. So they're tracking two nests um, over quite a few hundred uh, metre area. Um, that is woodland and fields. Um, it still took them over a week to find it. And that was the beginning of October. And at that time of the season, those nests are kicking out guys. They're kicking out sexuals, the drones, the queens ready for mating and hibernation. So that window of opportunity to find that nest needs to be reduced. And at the end of the day, if you can put 20, 30 beekeepers in that situation, that's, you know, 60, 40, 60 pairs of eyes instead of 10. You know, so I think definitely, you know, more beekeepers should be allowed to be involved with, with the MBU and um, tracking and tracing. Because at the end of the day, those beekeepers, they've been out to learn tracking and tracing from from Jersey. Um, it was funded by the London Beekeeping Association or, to send them out. So, and those those that learnt that have gone around to different beekeeping associations to train other people how to do it. So there's lots of people. Um, other than Grace, Squirrel, Wimburn. Yeah, so I'll just read that out for the people who are listening to this. Um, Polly Stewart says, other than great squirrels, I can't remember another non-native species that gets so much attention as the Asian Hornet. Why does the group think this is so? Because everybody loves bees. I mean, 
if you said to most people about the western conifer seed bug they wouldn't have a clue that it was an invasive species and they wouldn't care um the but only other also, sorry to jump in despite the gray squirrel destroying all the red squirrels people love squirrels whether you like or not they like to see a fluffy squirrel <laughs> sitting on the fence eating a nut they don't want to see well, it killed that, the end that, of the day. that's debatable <laughs> <laughs> as, a pest, as a pest controller, I'm sure it doesn't really matter. You, you Tastes know. like chicken. Yeah. Um, but that's why people, people aren't worried so much about grey squirrels because they're nice, fluffy little creatures. At the end of the day, then, that maybe Joe Public aren't worried that they've killed off all the, most of the red, you know, and there's only a few pockets of red squirrels left. And of but, course, the think, other... Think... Go on, Sean. Go on, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, I think the worry is, isn't it, that for everybody, whether you're a beekeeper or a non-beekeeper, that what we saw happen with the grey squirrel is um, copied by the Asian hornet, that the things that they move into, they absolutely wipe out. Because now you've got a handful of populations across the country of red squirrels, which are going down all the time. And the thought that that might happen to honeybees and pollinators is a real worry. And I think bees for me are a, a very good indicator of our social conscience, not just as beekeepers, not pest controllers. I mean, as society as a whole, the way we treat bees and the way we manage bees is absolutely an indicator of how we are behaving as a, um, as a population. The, the other thing I think that sort of kicked it off was this, which is not a bad thing, I suppose, is the slight misinformation between the Asian Hornet and the giant Asian Hornet. You know, oh, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> that yeah, it's complete. I mean, a lot of publications were putting out wrong pictures, wrong names, you know. And it was just, I mean, that's, yeah, I suppose. Quite if, something that no one knows exactly what it is because no one can actually, you know publicize what exactly it is um but i suppose because the thing the uh, giant asian hornet is quite so uh, it's not a bad thing that it was misinformation because they would be like jesus christ that's i don't want yeah, that thing yeah. you know yeah. um, but can you look at oh, no, i have, I have uh, information somewhere the amount of um sightings that was put into the mbu last year was over nearly twenty one thousand going oh, through the I, I help run the Asian Hornet database as well. UK you do. Database. Mm -hmm. Do you? And, yeah, on Facebook. All right. Um, and uh, there's what four, three and a half thousand members on there, and um, the amount of bad um, sightings or bad identifications is phenomenal, and they go yeah, through the. the beginning, but the more you teach people, what that's why they changed the name from Asian Hornet to Yellow Legged, because it's distinctive. But if you're putting yeah. out three or four different pictures of um, different different Hornets, no one knows what they're looking. They're all looking at something. Something's just black and yellow. Um, is, you know, is that another world? reason? Is that another reason why really we should be trying to rename it the Yellow Legged Hornet? Yeah, because it's quite a distinctive. You know, mm. I don't think there's any insects insects out there with the yellow legs. Yeah, um, that look like that. Um, so yeah, it's the distinct difference. Rod Smith. So Rod Smith makes a point. There is no way the Asian hornet will wipe out the honeybee. And I was talking to Clive about this a while ago, and I was saying it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because if you go to like Spain, um, parts of Italy, other areas like that, I think is it Italy, France? Um, I'm, I might be wrong, but there's certainly areas in the continent where they have varroa. Asian hornets and small hive beetle, and they still have a flourishing honeybee industry there. They've just had to learn to adapt and overcome. And this was one of the things I wanted to ask Jason about. Down, down there, bear in mind you had that many nests found or not found, whatever it was. How likely do you think it is that the Asian hornet is going to become a convenient excuse? for poor beekeeping and, and losses where it's like it was because of the Asian hornet and it wasn't. It was just because the beekeeper was fucking rubbish with bees. See, I know you asked that to Trevor last week. I remember that question. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it will be. Um, there's those beekeepers that won't admit to losing colonies due to their negligence. You know, losing it. You know, oh, the colony starved. No, it just died out. They, they won't admit to it. Yeah, they might put it down to Asian hornets. I'm sure they will. 
um, which is bad um, because then you're, I suppose you're making the situation far worse if you're just multiplying the amount of colonies that are lost um, to actually those that are physically being lost to it. Um, but yeah, it needs degree of, you know, ownership with the reason why people are not managing their colonies properly. Um, so there is going to be a stage though, isn't there, where beekeepers on the whole are just like, well, it's here, stuff you track and trace, they're here anyway, it's going to be, it, it is what it is, we'll just deal with it. How far do you think that is off? Oh, that's, that'd be a few years off, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, because at the end of the day, um, even to have that nest destroyed, you still got to track it. You still got to trace it and find where it is. Um, oh, I know well, if, well, I've well, got, if I've got a nest in my area um, that's predating on my honeybees, I want to find it. It doesn't matter whether that's five or ten years down the line. But um, theoretically, you, okay, you're going to find it. What are you going to do when you got it? When you found it? Well, for me, um, depending on what the situation, if it, if it turns out to be. Pest controllers then dealing with the situations like killing nests um, and someone training pesticides, then I'll go out and treat the nests. Will you though? Will you? Do you, do you go with hunting what? wasp nests? I don't specifically go hunting wasp nests, but if I know they're in a locality, then yeah, I will look for them. Um, I, I, I think that we are probably going to see us admit defeat before the end of this year, certainly before the end of next year. I think the here and the numbers that we can are, are yet to comprehend. And well, I think there's four four sightings already, and we're not even into April. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, I asked the guy at Pestex last week, at what point do they think the MBU will pass the situation over to either beekeepers and pest controllers? Um, he said at the point of 200. So the point they get to 200 nests. That, Sorry, that who said this? Up. Nigel Simmons. Nigel, yes. Yeah. Sorry. You were, were there then, over. Um, Yeah, 200 nests. Um, if we ain't at that number by the end of the year, I'll be highly surprised. Um, if you go by how many increased from the year before to last year. So, very close to it. just on the pest control side of that, Right, we find a nest. What are we going to treat it with anyway? Well, I understand they're Vulcan. using Vulcan. 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 Yeah. Have you ever hit um, a hole in its nest with Vulcan? No, not yet. I'm, <laughs> still, I'm, I'm still using How Firecam. That... <laughs> hey? I'm still using Firecam for now. Um, it, yeah, but, have, but it's indoor. Done... Fire, Firecam's indoor only, so we can't use that. But definite, even if I had it, we couldn't use that. But that's going at the end of this summer. But yeah, tell us about. So, have, have you ever treated a European hornet's nest, Jason? Because I haven't. We don't have them up here. No. Um, ask you. Ask you because this is a game changer. Go on, you tell about this. Why catch and not get the? I mean, European hornets. Um, I must admit, I've I've seen. I've never seen a Euro, European hornet nest. Um, I think I saw a queen producing one but that was about it never said i've never i think i've seen less than half a dozen european hornets at a bi um, i saw one last year at a colony in a roof that i went to survey for removal and that was hawking but apart from that never been had issues with european hornets never i mean so. clearly the asian hornet and a european hornet is a different size altogether but I think there's probably quite a few people listening that have hit a Asian, uh, a European, or had to do European hornets, and um, you've got your heart in your mouth. You, they are, you get a big European hornet's nest, and they are formidable. The sound is incredible when you hit it. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I did, uh, I did. The nests are slightly different um, because the bottoms are always open. Um, yes, Neil, they they definitely are. But because the bottom of a European hornet's nest is open, they come out all in one thump. It's like 
you hit it with something like um an aerosol or perbio chalk and it's like a it's like a like a polythene bag full of water hitting the floor that it's that loud it and and the and the sound and it, the humming is ridiculous and you're like well, i think i'm gonna get out of here pretty quick so um i know asian hornets are different but and obviously we've only going to have permethrin left, which is an exciter, um, you know, which is a, rep uh, a repellent to them. Um, they're going to get pretty, I know Robert Moon does it with um, uh, pyrethrum, um, but uh, again, excites them. So it's going to be quite a, you ain't going to be, I don't think you're going to be wanting to do it with an ordinary, you know, you're not going to want to do it with a little veil on, put it that way. No. What is it? I managed to get one of the BB Wear Ultra suits last year and the undergarment. So, um, I mean, the thing know. is, again, you know, they say when we get to 200, it's it's out of control. Okay, so that's probably going to be this year. How many mm. pest controllers are genuinely um, actually geared Lord. up to it anyway? We are. We could take it on tomorrow. Yeah. Well, yeah I think it comes down to most are? controls. Most pest controls are are kitted out to deal with you know um, wasps and that the vespers anyway. But I think it comes down to the height. The height we're looking at at some of these nests. You know, I mean, I've only got an AR8 pole, which is eight meters. Anything above that, yeah, it'd be, it'd be someone else. Um, unless we get a telehander up to it, but. But, yeah, it's those yeah, that get out all the height work, really. Um, yeah, so there's a there's a yeah, there's a couple of questions here, isn't there, that we need to address. The first one is Alistair Christie asks, Vulcan P five on Asian Hornets nests is okay, and what else is there? There's loads, there's loads. Um, it's probably the one of the few dusts that you have um external on, isn't there? I think pie dust, although they've changed the name of that. I think you could probably use that natural chrysanthemum. So yeah, it's probably not as strong, but I don't think it makes a difference if you inject and direct into the nest. The you thing get, with the natural, you've just got to give them a wallop, don't you? Yeah, and the thing with the natural chrysanthemum one is it breaks down under sunlight very, very quickly. So you, yeah. could, although you, you, so you can hit a nest, and literally, as far as I'm aware, the next day there is no residual insecticide, no yeah. residual, but then duality at all. But, everybody's talking about dusts because it's what we're used to with wasps but if you start looking at um liquids you know um safe methane the, the ones that i know of that i use and you've got to remember that every pest controller has their own sort of things but you've got safer max plus safer methane 10 um you could use prevector which is non-toxic on them the, the, there is a mul yeah yeah i would because we use that on wasps all the time and it's it's brilliant so the, there's loads of different things that are there that can be used i'm trying to look for a photograph here of how not to do it um it was on the yarm job actually um i'm looking through now but it's taken forever but if you want to um yeah cpw40 if that's got external on it killing them isn't difficult killing wasps or hornets isn't difficult if they get that chemical on them the problem comes when you have an entry point that is away from the nest so it's going in an air brick and it's two meters back it's going in a tile and the 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 nest is two meters into the thing that was when FICAM came into its own and when we lose that but most my understanding and i might be wrong is that most of your um asian hornets nests are going to be in the open or attached to the outside of a building you know um i know in fact, I'm not going to go into that because that's going to steal John de Carter at Thunder for next week. Um, but I'm sure he's going to tell us about where he finds them, where they have, where they haven't, et cetera, et cetera. And we can probably discuss it from there. But the, I would think there will be a lot. Um, goes, yeah. But so. I think you find yes. that most of the nests in this country have been external outside. Um, yeah. I think there have been some found in buildings, uh, but not very many. So, Jason, you are starting up as a pest controller now, that's right, Ned? Yep. To deal with flying and stinging insects. Anything that flies. You're a, bee, you're, 
yeah, fly, fly, fly insects had sting, so wasps, hornets, etc. Air dick lance goes out to 30 meters if you can see the nest in a tree. But, and here is the problem, and this is why I believe that um, pest controllers and beekeepers have to work together. The price on them, if I said to you, now at the point in your career, are you going to go and spend five grand on a 30 meter lance to deal with this? Not at the moment, because we ain't got authorization to use them. It would just be silly. Yeah, yeah. oh, no, you could use Not so much on, on hornets. I'd only buy it for purely for hornet use, really. Because um, I haven't come across any wasp nests that are 30 metres up in the air. Yeah, but this is this is what I'm trying to say at the moment. The the pest con and th this is my worry and my concern. The pest control has been put over there. We're dealing with it. But the people who are going to have the financial resources to buy these tools um, are going to be pest controllers. And even yourself, who's wanting to go into that, that line of work, the expenditure to buy it is so much. Like what, it, realistically, if, you, if you're spending five grand on a lance, how many nests are you going to do over the year? And what sort of price do you have to put in to make it worthwhile? to buy that lance is a is a financial um going for your business so it's like and if you're a beekeeper and there is a nest 30 meters up on a tree what are you going to do who are you going to ring so it's no good saying to pest controllers at the moment you sit over there you need to get them involved now because if they get the 200 nests by july and the step back what are you going to do? What, where are you going to go? Like, this is what I was saying to you, Jason. What if I could give you a wish list now of moving forward? What would you do in terms of everything? Like, imagine you were in charge of it. What would you do? Oh, without doubt. I mean, bring in more people. I mean, that is the fundamental thing. More people involved in it, the the better the situation is going to be. Yeah, at the end of the day, if you're if you're looking at half a dozen people looking for two nests over the course of two weeks, whereas you could have 30, 40 people looking for those same two nests and then, you know, more resources to be able to destroy those nests, then these things are going to get dealt with a lot quicker, a lot more efficiently. Um, I think that's where the fundamentals lies. But until, um, until governmental legislation or whatever's controlling these situations is divulged then yeah we're always going to be in the, in, in the hands of the NBU um, but there they are I think that's what needs to be done because yeah always feel that it's going to be you're going to need the bee the beekeepers to do the tracking and tracing yeah and the pest controllers to do the destruction because um, then let's face it a lot of beekeepers won't want to be involved with the destruction they're not in, interested in the destruction of wasp nests unless it's a easy and very local to them and you know they can reach it and things like that but they won't want to deal with asian hornets i don't think they won't no one won't want to treat them um but that's where the feet on the ground come um at the end of the day if you've got all all these beekeeping associations that are all trained for track and trace um then that's that's where where it needs to be because at the end of the day you've got to find these nests yeah you might have asian hornets predating on the honeybees um but where are they going? Where are they coming from? Um, so I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something because I gig, I giggle at this. Have a watch of this, Jason. Let's see what you think of this. For anybody out there who is watching this, this this photo caused a bit of upset last year. So I don't know anything about the chainsaw. Um, I was under the impression that a chainsaw suit is designed to block the chainsaw to stop it running. Um, I don't know what he's going to do underneath, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they've given a can of wasp nest destroyer. Now, my Hugh, tell us where it's wrong. That basically shoots a project. I've never used it because it's an amateur use product, yep. I think. So I don't, I don't know if you're allowed to use amateur use products as a professional. Are you to charge for that service? Uh, yeah, you could. Could you? I thought that have amateur and professional use. Um, it's the other way uh, around. Is it? I thought. But what, yeah. What, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll double check that. It's not what you would but choose. You, yeah, but here's the thing: you've got a, you've got a, you've got a can which shoots a projectile, a very short burst, and it's designed to hit something at like forty foot or something like that. Is it? Uh, if you just, you wouldn't get it that far. How far? Ten foot. Ten foot, even ten foot. But if you're up close and personal to that, and it's in your face, 
like what are you going to do because there you, you are using a long range sniper rifle to fight something in your face it's absolute for me i would be very very uncomfortable sending a lad um up close and personal to anything with that product it's the wrong way to do for me as a professional i feel like it's a wrong way to deliver it unless he was shooting it from fairway down and then getting up close to it but if that is his backup like once they're flying and you're shooting a, you know you're basically trying to laser that's beam them out the air aren't you in the defense of that picture i think the nest was destroyed the day before wasn't it yeah but the reason why they've given that is because there was still a chance of um asian hornets hanging around isn't it you know, you put something like Prevecta in a spray gun um, where you can put a, a, a wide nozzle on it up close, you can hit them and they're dead before they hit the floor. Like, And this is why I think, me, me, me personally, why I think you need people with the knowledge, not just who have done a, a one-day course on whatever it is in order to climb that tree, which I'm guessing he probably hasn't got. They've given it to him and said, don't worry, spray them with that if there's any left over, um, I, would, I would presume. But for me... Like to put someone in that position against something he's never seen, never dealt with. And again, I might be wrong. He might be a pest controller or what have you. But that for me is the wrong, the wrong way to deliver that insecticide at that place. You know, it, it's just, I just feel like it's, it's, it's wrong. Um, and there's so many more suitable options for him to have some sort of protection up close and personal, you know, that he could have used. Enough. What do you think, you Agree? Disagree? Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, it's not something I wouldn't, you know, it's like sending sending somebody out there with a fly swatter, isn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah, edit, to kill it, out, job yeah. done. You know, you shouldn't be worried that you're going to go up there and there's anything left. Do it properly and they're, they're going to be dead as a dodo. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. And you could quite easily knock that nest off from the ground. That Well, that's the next thing, isn't it? Yeah. Why, why climb the tree if you don't have to? Just poke it off. Yeah. Job done. What, um, how do you think it's going? Lot, sorry, a lot of nests in France. They um, just leave now, don't they? I believe. Just leave, yeah. Just leave them. Do they? Sorry. If you're using something like um, the... Um, Natural pyrethrin. Yeah, sorry, I mean, words then. There wouldn't yeah, be a problem with it. No residual on it and it just decays then it should be fine yeah. yeah you've got 20 you know 12 hours and it's a sun, bit of sunlight job done because mm. mm. you, you remove every wasp nest that you destroy you know if you've got a wasp nest tucked in the eaves of a building you, you're not going to be removing it i know yeah we leave them there we leave them there you don't get many problems you make doing every this effort to remove it always unless it's unsafe to do so yeah of course you're not climbing over um ghosts to get it, are you? Neil Bond. I asked one year. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of talk of these in there. So how do you feel like the arrival of Asian Hornets is going to affect your beekeeping business? Oh, it's gonna affect it immensely, you know. Um I say that at a point when, you know, when my honeybee colonies are being predated on um, at the moment, yeah, they're not affecting it. But once they are starting to be predated on, it's going to affect it. Of course it will. Um, that'd be down to me to manage the situation and manage um, losses and Asian hornets at the apiary site. Um, it's just going to be a complete ball ache, to be honest, from what I've seen. Other people managing theirs, um, using the different things that are, are currently being available. Um, more expense, um, more stress, more worry. You know, it's bad enough coming out winter time, opening new colonies is fine. Let alone worrying all through the season. Bad enough. So this water. is, so this is the next thing. In are you going to have to produce more splits earlier in the year? Are you going to have to get queen breeding done earlier in the year? Is it going to change things from that? Are you going to have to manage them and hope to God that you, I don't know, you're just going to have to accept that you're going to get losses because of their behaviour within the apiary? Are you going to split your apiaries up, smaller apiaries, more kicked around or what? Are you going to put them all together and hope that it's safety in numbers? Like, they just no idea and sort of suck it and see or what? Or what, what are you going to do? No, I suppose it's down to every, every apiary location. Say I've got five or six apiaries. 
I've got another two Aprix coming in this year. But um, yeah, it depends how each each April is going to be. I guarantee every eight, each April is not going to be the same. Um, hopefully, there are some April that won't be touched at all. But you know, at some point, Asian haunting will spread. If it spreads as much as in Europe, then pretty much all April will be eventually um, affected. So yes, yeah, managing the situation as and when it happens, and how the severity of the situation, I suppose, um, then depart. Depends how 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 and what processes are used to do it. So, could we see more beekeepers become pest controllers to deal with Asian hornets? Uh, depends how those beekeepers no. see no. the situation being dealt with. I know a lot of beekeepers that aren't interested in destroying the nests. They just want to find them. They want to protect their apiaries. They're not worried about being involved in the destruction of them. I think that's a, it, that would be a lot of effort for little return. Yeah. 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 And the, 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 the problem that they are going to have is that they are going to have no idea of the costs of setting up as a pest controller. And then all of a sudden the returns to just deal with Asian hornets and then they've got to go into actually running a business and then you've got to, you, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to do wasps and then it takes you away from your bees and, you know, and most beekeepers tend to be 40 to 70 year old and retired with a bit of time on their hands they don't want to start running a business do they um, no but <laughs> i i am <laughs> mid 40s and yeah. starting a beekeeping business um uh yeah i think starting it last year with the onset of asian hornets coming and i thought well i mean the main reason i did pest did the pest course was because i was getting called out to towards the end of the season, more people saying, oh, I've got bees in my house, got bees in my house, turn up, turn out to be wasps. So instead of walking away and leaving it, passing them to someone else, I'm there, I can deal with the situation. And then think, oh, Asian hornets are coming on. Then in a few years' time, potentially look at um, dealing with that situation as well. Um, so, yeah, so for me, it was, it was, an, it was another bow to the business, I suppose, um, at the end of the day because the wasps are still going to be around. Like All it? pest controllers yeah. carry out track and trace as part of the service they provide. I don't see it working. Can't. Not, I just, not enough right. money in it. Yeah. To be honest. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. it's just not going to happen. Yeah. If if the if the government want to pay us enough money, then that's a different yeah. matter. But, you know. But yeah, um, the point, the what point is, you know, even the government going to pay pest controllers to destroy those and all in this. At what point they're not going to pay for that forever? Well, they certainly dished oh. out enough money with foot and mouth, and they dished it out uh, once again. They dished it out to the large pest control companies. They didn't ju ju dish it out to the smaller ones because as soon as a farm got foot and mouth, the pest control contract was taken out, taken away from the incumbent pest controller, and handed to national companies. In fact, lots of pest control companies went bankrupt. Well, went went down the pan. When Asian, oh, when Asian hornets, when when foot and mouth was on, because for that reason, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I see it from a pest control point of view that you know, since doing it, you get involved in, um, so you don't know what species of insects you've got in the kitchen, so you put down traps, and you've got you've got to monitor that situation. Um, but I don't see pest controllers doing track and trace, you know, spending a week or two weeks tracking flight lines and things like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't see it. Yeah, Gillian Turner raises the point. She says it's not just about honeybees, it's about the effect on native insects and knock on effect of birds, mammals, reptiles that should be feeding on insects that the Asian hornets have consumed. There's also the damage to food crops or food chain implications. I think you're right. Well, of course it is. You know, when you think that a, a single Asian hornet nest consumes what 12 and a half kilos of insects throughout its, throughout its yearly cycle. So you think those 72 nests last year. That's that's what eight hundred kilos of insects, insects that, mm -hmm. that were destroyed throughout the season before those nests were destroyed. That's a lot, you know. I've I've got a video from that um, situation down in Canterbury of a butterfly landing on the bait on the bait tray, and the Asian hornet went for it. Luckily, the butterfly got away. Um, yeah, they're, they're not going to be um, selective. You know, Asian hornet aren't going to be selective like we have to be in in catching the queens. No way. They'll take whatever they can. Spiders. Anything. Um, yeah, yeah. He has a question for you, Jason. You're starting up in business. 
and you've got to deal with stinging insects. And someone rings you up and says, they've stood back. It's now up to us. There's an Asian hornet's nest, 15 meters up in a tree. How much is this going to cost us to get rid of? Go on then, talk me through that. <laughs> Most difficult question in the world. I can only go by what I was told current um, nests cost the MBU to destroy. Somewhere a reason of two to four hundred pounds to destroy an Asian hornet nest. Um, but then again, that comes down to where it is. If you've got to get a spider in there or a telehander, because you can't still can't access it with you know a pole or anything like that, then yeah, I don't know, it's extra normal. It's no, go on then. Someone rings you up. What are you going to tell them? How are you going to price it up? <sighs> yeah, price it quid. But then it gets the same scenario with the, with the honeybees. You know, how do you price it up? It's like, well, you know, if it's 10, 10 15 metres up in the air, it's access. If you can't reach yeah. it with the equipment you've got, then you've got access. So that's, you know, 10 metre up in the chimney to remove a colony of honeybees, that's probably a £1,000 for scrap over the loan, let alone days' labour. And, you know, but then again, customers got an Asian hornet nest in their tree and it's not really bothering them. Are they going to pay up, say, five, six hundred pounds to have it removed? Yeah, you know, this is the issue. It's like, yeah, fair enough. It's you got wasp nests in your house that's affecting you. Then you have you you pay seventy, eighty, ninety quid to have it destroy it because it's affecting you. But if it's fifteen meters up in the tree, Joe Bloggs ain't going to pay a few hundred quid to have it removed. It's not it's not bothering them. So this this so is do, where the issue. So do you think? Do you think that's going to cause the spread of Asian hornets far faster than when people? At the minute, everything gets found and killed. But you're yeah. you're absolutely right. If you're a farmer and it's 15 meters up in a tree, you ain't paying that money to get that nest destroyed, are you? It's just not happening, is it? When you look at that. You think if you're a farmer that's playing paying for crop pollination of soft fruits, and those Asian hornets are affecting your pollinating that you're paying out for, then you may do. But if you're an, if you're an arable farmer that's making wheat, you're not going to worry about an Asian hornet nest in, in a tree in your field somewhere. So, Jud judge, judging on how most farmers, how much grain they lose to rat contamination, they ain't going to be, well, they're not going to be bothered to, <laughs> you know, it's going to be like, oh, yeah, well, whatever. Yeah. 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 You know, there was there was reports last year of a farmer down here in the South East that did destroy an Asian hornet nest by setting it alight. Is that right? Well, yeah. Whether that was, and that wasn't reported. That was just, I want to say hearsay, but it actually was. Pretty close to an Asian hornet nest that was destroyed by the NBU. So, but yeah, so at the end of the day, yeah, same principle, right? You, you're going to pay silly money to have something destroyed that's not really bothering you. So, for the beekeepers watching, they get Asian hornets in their apiary site because you're starting to see it from both sides of the fence now. Um, NBU have stood back. Realistically, what options do they have available to them? Well, the, the beekeepers uh, by that point will be uh, willing to track and trace. They'll be doing their own tracing. So if they can find the nest, then I suppose um, pest controllers that have been allowed to destroy Asian hornet nests can be, be called to say, you know, we found the nest. There it is. Can you do something about it? I think that'd be the way yeah. to do you, you see I, I i like to try and look for and i think what's going to happen is you'll teach these guys track and trace they'll do track and trace for the first couple of nests they'll get a handful of them that they can't find because they're inaccessible they're on a cliff face they're fucking buried in um brambles and you know you've got an elderly workforce for without being insulting you've almost got dad's army out like trying to chop it up someone's been badly stung or whatever it is and then all of a sudden they'll say do you know what it is We've done it and there's still asian audits in the apiary because there was another nest they didn't find they'll say it's pointless just set your traps i honestly believe hand on my heart now you need to get a pro as a beekeeper you need to get a process in place that you are comfortable as going to reduce the pressure of asian hornets on your bees what that is i don't know yeah you're gonna to have to manage it at some point you, you can't you can't spend the next say from my instance my beekeeping business i can't spend the next 20 years track spending weeks or days at time tracking Asian hornet nests. Um, you just can't do it. 
So yeah, you you turn to managing it, uh, managing the situation um, better. You know, I mean, there's plenty, there's plenty of experience coming from France of people out there. You know, I mean, they keep thousands of hives. Uh, they manage the Asian hornets. You know, with pest control going around killing the Asian hornets. Um, beekeepers managing their hives. I think it's that initial shock and awe of Asian hornets in the country destroying hives. But long term, it'll be manageable. Yeah. Polly Stewart raises another good point. Didn't I hear that if we find one, we can deal with it? The answer is absolutely yes. If you've had the, um, I'm going to put a caveat to that. If you've had the correct training and the correct use of the insecticides to deal with a hornet's nest, um, then you can deal with it. The MBU ask that they are reported to them. And I'm going to say that if you find one, please don't deal with it. Just give them a shout because the last thing you want is to be blamed for the, the loss of control of Asian hornets across the country. You know, you've got to be invited. Was it Alex says to me all the time? You've got to be invited to the party first, don't you? Do you know what I mean? You can't invite yourself, can you? So I would say just leave it with them. But if you have had the correct training, um, you know, you're a pest controller where you're level two or you've got your, you've done your insecticides ticket or whatever it is, then, yeah, you, you can and you haven't done anything wrong, although it would be vastly frowned upon. And I think you would create a number of enemies and leave yourself open to a huge amount of um, Criticism. shit that you're going to get. Yeah, you're going to get loads, aren't you? But, yeah, you, you can. Um, and I've got that in an email from the MBU um, when I spoke to them. Um about something else um yeah get a ticket yeah exactly but well, i don't know we'll see we'll see um but nigel nigel said to me i said at what point do pest controllers get involved he said obviously after you get to the point with 200 nests or whatever um but then the contract will be put out to the main um pest control so the mppca the mpta and then they will be put out to local pest controllers in the area of that nest. Um, so basically, no, no they will put it out to a big national good. company. Yeah, they will yeah. want yeah. a standard price throughout the country, and they will put it out to a national pest control company without a doubt. It won't be any local people. The only way local people will be in, involved will be that they will be asked to be subcontracted from the main from the main contractor such as the big ones yeah it'll be what all, was, all over again yeah what was it um you were saying about the handover was that document was it you was talking about that document where it says about the the different phases and how they're going to deal with it etc etc what does it actually say in there what on the contingency plan mm -hmm. i'll tell you what it says regards to the eventual Find it quickly. Uh, moving from eradication to containment, that bit. Um, yeah, go on. If, if an outbreak provide, proves to be an established and widespread, the LGD meeting, I uh, don't know what that abbreviation is, taking the advice of the NDCC, may advise ministers that eradication as a control method no longer remains practicable. So basically after 200 nests, they won't deem it practicable. Um, Ministers agree a policy of containment will be implemented depending on the extent of the outbreak. The shift from eradication to containment may be very swift, um, far swifter than they can get other beekeepers involved in track and trace, that's for sure. The lift in the surveillance areas will be considered by the LGD in light of the extent and spread of the outbreaks. Decision will be coordinated with the devolved governments. The MBU will then concentrate its efforts on providing technical advice and training services for beekeepers a bit late for that containment sounds like a zombie yeah. apocalypse doesn't it yeah um oh, training services for beekeepers pest controllers so you'll get you'll get trained on it and local authorities to recognize asian hornet and put in place pest management methods to reduce its impact on colonies longer term management options for dealing with the pest will be considered by the lgd um, a communication strategy will be de developed to ensure that internal colleagues and external stakeholders are informed of any changes. Um, uh, so, at the end of the day, that is in the, if you can read that, pest specific contingency plan for yellow legged Asian hornet. Um, My, so, last week I raised some 
concerns and my main concern is what's going to happen is they when it gets to that handover point which i didn't realize i'd put a figure on was that they would walk away and it would just be left with people to sort of pick up the pieces but from reading that there and from your knowledge of the talk that nigel simmons gets the underlying i'm feel the underlying feeling i'm getting today and correct us where i'm wrong is basically when they hit 200 nests they walk away they go back to doing efb and efb and it's just gonna have to run its course and sort itself out yeah 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 because yeah, what does con like neil says what 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 is containment what's containment yeah. how do you contain hornets yeah i don't know um containment, like, ring trapping in some way to an area well, yeah, it's not I, it? It, I mean by that point 200 nests if they can't destroy them by that point then it's, you're not going to contain it in in the country you're not going to contain it in a specific area um that goes to show the amount of you know the widespread the nests were last year at least anyway um so yeah and um, how widespread the individual sightings are already um yeah, you can't complain. You can't complain. yeah the next thing then how are you gonna you're a young business starting out cash flow is king you know you're gonna need that work to come in like how are you gonna look and this sounds very um mercenary but you know you have to be a little bit like this in business to survive agree you how are you yeah. gonna make this work for you it's good if it's going to bash your beekeeping business how do you turn that negative into a positive what what are you going to do what you're going to put in place i think i know what we'll do um yeah how are you gonna where are you gonna go with that jace um well yeah it depends how hard the beekeeping side gets hit yeah i mean my big as i say at the end of the day um i don't have hives there's there's no there's no money in honey unless you've got hundreds of hives or thousands of hives so I mean, my biggest side of it, my business is the is the removals, uh, which is where I feel it will hit the most, because it's all very well managing colonies that I can see. It's those colonies you can't see, the feral ones that will be hit. I think you know the hardest. So that for my business, that side of it will be um, quite a struggle. Um, I know at the moment there seems to be a lot of feral colonies, especially in buildings. There's a lot that I know of um and if those those colonies are predated on then there's going to be a big side of my business but moving forward yeah so that's why i moved into the pest control side of it the wasps and that um but i've got other other avenues in the pipeline that will help um with my business um but yeah it's the b side of it it's just gonna have to manage it um so neil asks a question how far do workers forage from the nest which actually chances are i can't answer i don't know if sean can answer i don't know if jason can answer but we have somebody next week who probably will be able to answer what's up to you know jason yeah, thousand about, meters. That's, yeah thousand i've been meters. told i've been told that the vast majority are bound within 500 meters but as Jason says, they will travel up to a thousand meters, maybe a little bit further um, to get to where they want to be. And I think that's why a lot of these Asian hornet nests are not found by beekeepers. Um, you know, I think. But as you say, next week, I think we're going to have a blowout with John Armour because I think he'll be able to answer all of these questions, won't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, should be a good yeah, one. Yes, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the main bulk of the, the colonies that were lost this last year down in Folkestone um I think he lost 11 11 colonies in total to Asian Hornets um let me just read he said 17 colonies 15 lost eight they found eight Asian Hornet nests um within a thousand meters of his apiary but they were tracking 11 flight lights but they only destroyed eight nests so there's three nests that were missed um and potentially they were um in the cliff faces um so yeah that's it it's, um, but the thing is they must know if they missed them or not because it's not rocket science is it if you've killed eight and there's still asian hornets turn up in the apiary it means that there's another nest that you haven't got to in it yeah they were tracking it um yeah it is but it comes down to 
the land, the, the area down there, I don't know if you've ever Googled, if you Google map, um, Capital of Fern, it's basically, his apries are on top of the cliff, you then got the cliff, and then you've got um, wooded shrubland underneath it. Um, yeah, as you said, the cliff face wasn't, ex in it. it's inaccessible, it's a good few, few hundred feet of vertical cliff that you can't access. You can't, unless you have sail down it, but because of the, cause of the um, trees down there and stuff, they even abseil in it is a nightmare. But yeah, they couldn't track the nests. They couldn't find the nests because they're in the cliff, cliff face. So, you know, and they're yeah. coming up the cliff to the apiary and then back down again. Um, I think, I think oh, Neil is... I, yeah, I, I, went I down promise to you. Fern, went down to Capital of Fern with uh, Peter and Simon Spratley, who's down there, who's their apiary. Um, we flew drones but down there with, with Peter we flew drones, even that was a nightmare and that was September when the ivy was in flower um, previous to that you could walk around with a wick station and have Asian hornets landing on it because the ivy was in flower the ivy was far more attractive to Asian hornets than any trap it so they weren't getting them and um, so you couldn't see them. The dense undergrowth down there, you just couldn't see them. So, you know, when you're flying drones down there, because of the trees and stuff like that, you still couldn't see them. I I just believe, and I know I mentioned this last last week about technology. I just can't believe for one second that with the technology that we have available to us today, I don't know, some sort of little um, we report 339 nests of all size last year, making a running total, a seven year running total of 765. We only know of about 12 hives in this time. Um, right. So I, I just think that the pro that with the technology that we have available, you see little tracking things, like the ability to put a tracker on a dro on a Asian hornet and then follow it with a drone with some sort of um, connection between the two, it must be achievable somehow, somewhere, and then get onto them straight away when they are to. If the, if it's that easy as it lands on, dub a glue, off it flies, and someone with a drone goes, mm -hmm. there it is, there it's it is. Money, There's got it, to though? be something. It's money. You Do you not think that we? The little, little, you know, the, the technology these days is becoming small. So yeah. why can't you find, why can't you, why is a track and not being produced? But then I suppose it may come down to um, weight ratio. The wasp, the, the hornet doesn't like it, it won't fly properly, won't go fly to the right place. Um, yeah, but I'm talking about, you know, that, you know, that tag that they put on them, that like reflective tag, there must be something that can pick that up, something which is going to, I don't know, bend eye or light, like, you know, like um, the bird free gel, bird free gel, basically, it's a gel that we use for um, pigeons, and it interferes with the eye or light that hits it. So when birds see it, they believe they are looking at flames and they won't land on it, or that's what we are told. But whatever happens, it definitely interferes with light sources. And you think, like, if you could get something physical that you took that, that that strip, if that interferes with IR light, and for, there must be something. I know I'm talking pie in the sky, but the the technology that we have available to us today, there must be something or numerous things that we can start to deploy to find them. My worry is that's what's going to happen: is the handover is going to be so fast that it'll just be lost. We won't ever do it. Yeah, yeah, no, there's potential. Um, yeah, so considering France have been dealing with this for lots of, what's this, 2004 or something, it's like, you know, you would have thought that, you know, and the amount of mess that Jersey find. Um, but then again, Jersey's got a lot of eyes on the ground, so um, they can find their nests. Um, yeah, technology will definitely be a game changer when someone develops. I know at the moment there's a guy developing um, AI to recognise Asian hornets on bait traps. And he's trying to, I think he's trying to um, recognize the noise given off by an Asian hornet when it's flying. Um, well, there's already like... fly, there's electric fly killers that can identify what's going on, what's on the fly killer. So that's not too far away anyway. It's again, it's just money, isn't it? It's just money. Yeah. Well, this is the thing, yeah. I mean, if it's, if it is, he had more funding from the government and things like that, all these developments, things would be done a lot easier. But. You know, this AI technology this guy's inventing, 
he's doing it all off his own back. He's, you know, so it is going to take time. But, um, See, so, I, I'm looking at John's comment there about the 339 nests, which is a seven-year total of 765. I would love to see that graph plotted of how they've found them. And then if you laid that over us to see what happens, because obviously we're a far bigger um, landmass than Jersey, it would be incredibly interesting to see if you forecasted them together where we will be in next year, the year after, the year after. And uh, I think we're going to be in a position where we will stop counting long before the, the, the Jersey lads are still counting at year seven. I think we're going to stop counting next year and the year after. Well, um, I just take, think it's going to go nuts. Take that in perspective, the three nests that weren't located last year down Capel. All right. So yeah. if they spit out three to 400 guys last, last year, so that's, that's 1,200. Know, yes, 900 to 1,200 um, queens. Even if 10% of those survived over the winter time, because it was quite a mild winter, let's face it, um, you know, that's more nests. That's single queens, more single queens than actually nests were discovered last year alone. That's without the ones that were, that were found. You know, even got nests that were found late season last year. So that one that I, I was with, 24th of October, by then, that's spitting out queens yeah. and drones. Oh, yeah, you know, way so before that, then, I should was, think. Yeah, three, six, seven nests in October in the prime time of the season when it's spitting out guys and drones, you know, and then two in November. So that's nine nests um, with potential was that two and a half thousand queens, you know, if 10% of those survive, that's 200. That's 200 queens straight out, you know, survive over winter time. Um, I know Nigel, Nigel at Pestex last week, I keep saying this, um, he said that, 90 to 95 percent of queens died over winter time. How do you know that? You don't. Um, it wasn't. We're not Arctic winters. It was a mild winter. Yeah, we've had a lot of rain, but not a lot of cold, you know, frosts and temperatures like that. Um, you know, I've spotted half a dozen queens that clearly didn't die over winter time. You know, huddled away. Oh, well, Before, mate, well, you know, it's if we've had, if we've had four found already on the mainland. Imagine how many have come out. Yeah. If you've had four found, like you are looking at a lot of them which are away, aren't they? Because we certainly didn't have four found this at this point last year, did we? Not that we're aware of. Not that we're aware of. Um, the only one I would say is the one in, in Ash uh, in Kent. Um, that was tipped out of a pot. It wasn't even on the wing. That was still hibernating. So there's obviously the chance that you're still going to get a substantial amount that are still hibernating. Um, but yeah, if you found two that are alive or one, you know, one that came in and some are dead, then it might be just a freak accident and they died. But yeah, it's, it's not looking good. Figures aren't going to be looking good. Um, I'm trying to find the, um, I'm trying to find the, 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 the rolling updates, national B unit. Let's see how many we had last, um, um, Neil's got a question, but I think what we'll do is we'll probably save that but these sorts of questions till next week. Can you tell us more about the habits of Asian hornets making two nests? Um, I think that's going to be a question for next week, Neil. Uh, I do know a little bit. Go on, yeah, so, no, uh, um, please. Queen, queen will, queen will uh, produce a primary nest, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, that's the foundry or founding queen. And then once that nest gets to a certain size, she will, the workers will then start a secondary nest. Um, that queen will then emerge and then she'll fly to the secondary nest um, and then carry on the main nest. And the workers will continue with the primary until all those young and larvae have hatched and they all move up to the secondary. That's it. Over, over the so, course of that. So the secondary will probably be produced by about July, that's when the main bulk of the workers will be predating on um, insects and so on and so forth. Right, so last year, the first sample was knocked out that we actually found was in May. Um, there, was a cred there, was cred there was a credible sighting 
I lost three credible sightings in April, and the first actual specimen was found in May. So we're in March, and we've had basically four found. Yeah. Yeah, I've got some paper of it, yeah. So we've got one in Newcastle in April, yeah. Single all it captured. In May... Oh, sorry, actually, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in May, there's one found in Canterbury anyway. So we're in March, and we found one in not far from Canterbury. Um, yeah, then July, then we start having one, two, three, four nests destroyed in July. We go to single hornet. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's... It's going to be long before we start finding more, without a doubt. Um, um, but, 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 uh, here we go. And last, I think, last question, I think. Um, the number of nests in France continues to rise until they get on, that under control. Can't see it happening. Um, we are going to get new arrivals every year, and I tend to agree with you, Gillian, because the play this isn't just getting spread out from the south coast up. You've had them at Hull, you've had them at Yarm, you've had them. It, we've now got them at Preston over on there, Southampton. You know they they're starting to pop up. Obviously, the south coast is the hot spot, but they're popping up all over the country, aren't they? I think so. Yeah, I mean, if, even if the one in Preston did come over by chance, hitchhiking on the lorry, um, it just goes to prove that, yeah, we're still going to get them. Um, to preventing them come on, coming over. You know, we can't stop people coming over and thing is how we're going to stop an insect at the end of the day. Um, it's inevitable. Inevitable. Without a doubt. Um, so How long have they been established in France for? Well, the first one was in 2004, wasn't it? So ever since 2004. First one, first, first mighty queen come in on a shipment of China. Who was it, 2004? Mm. So, yeah, there you go, since, since then. Um, well, so yeah, we were like 18, 10 years, 20 years. Are you going to ask the questions then, Sean? Yeah, let's go for it. Thank you very much for coming on, but we've got three last questions for you, young man. Go um, for it. First of all, I'm going to put this... Um, can I put that on? It's not working. My banners aren't working, Hugh. Do you want to try them? Ah, oh, I've just put it on. Um, have you enjoyed your time on the podcast? Yes, I have. Yes, actually. Um... Actually. <laughs> I say, this Everyone's is stressed. Gone... Eh? Everyone stresses and then they get on and they're like, it's not that bad, it's all right, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm, to be honest, I'm not actually comfortable with this live streaming side of it, even though the amount of videos I put up. But, yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, it just, it just gets, you fall into it naturally, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. So you're um, saying, give right? us a shameless plug. Shameless plug, arms, aprons, live bee removals. Bee removal side supposed? of it, yeah. Sorry. You've got to give us a bit more of a plug than that. Arms Apries, yeah. we do live bee removes, removes in, five, in the five, area. Five bee, established colonies of honeybees from commercial and residential properties covering Kent, Sussex and Surrey and Essex. Um, all colonies removed are located on my Apries in the southeast um, to carry on their wonderful hard work and, yeah, providing... That's Good service to us, so we can carry on living as well. Um, all the bi all the byproduct, all the all the wax gets produced in candles. Um, yeah, nothing goes to waste. Right. Yeah, hard work. So, who would you like to see come on the podcast? If he's watching, Simon Spratley. He probably waited. So Simon Spratley owned the apiary down in Folkestone, Capital Fern. Um, yeah, without doubt. Tell us a little bit about Simon then, quickly. So Simon, Simon's pest control. I think I can't remember he works oh. for Brown Three or something pest control. Um, but yeah, he's got an, he had the apiary down at Capital of Fern, um, up on the hilltop. Um, it was him who lost a lot of colonies last year to Asian hornets. Um, yeah, knows knows a lot of information about what's going on as well. Um, John Cataract will know him, I believe. He speaks to him. Um, he's part of the Asian Hornet team WhatsApp that we've got. He's helped produce. I will plug also the AsianHornetAlert.org.uk website. Um, I can't put a picture up. 
How can I put a link up for that? Um, go to go to preset pre oh. present at the bottom. Present. Click on that, and then click share screen, and it'll come up with your screens, and you can just bang it on there for people to have a look, or we'll try and put it in the comments. Um, what's it called, Jace? Hold on, let me see. It comes up. Oh. Uh, share screen. Share screen. Is this good? Can you see that? Not yet. Click on the one you want to share and press share. Right. Oh, uh, uh, we got time for a weird question, do you think? That. Can you see that? No. Um, no, but I can tell you what, I can share it. So if I, I'll do it for you here. I've got it. That screen there? No. But that's, that's not mine. That's not mine. That's Asian you. Hornet. That's Asian Hornet Alert. Org. Uk. Oh, I just made that up. Yeah, maybe. Um, can I send if I send you the link via? Yeah, send us it via WhatsApp. Um, yeah, WhatsApp is it? Or Messenger yet? Yeah, and then I'll send bang that up. Wait, while we do that, go on, Hugh. Ask the weird question. Just been asked interested now. Yeah, this is a, a question we've been asked, and trust me to ask it. And I know this is not going to be. What? I know what it is. I can guess what it is. Does anybody know anything about fipronil custard? Oh, I know a lot about custard. I can well, guess what it is. Apparently, who's asked that? Point. I'm not saying. But somebody's asked it, and um, I believe that fipronil custard would obviously be um, fipronil mixed with something. Uh, fipronil is an insect growth regulator. Um, so somebody would be mixing it with something that was attractive to Asian hornets so that they would feed the insect growth regulator back to their... Um, back to the back to the larvae um now the problem with that is uh, to the person that asked it um i will believe that you need to buy your fipronil pretty quickly um because fipronil is going to be withdrawn from use um because I don't believe i may be completely wrong but i don't believe it will be continued because of fipronil is also used in it's a mixture of fipronil and egg yolk there you go how do you know that, Gillian? You naughty girl. <laughs> so, fipronil is not going to be continued for forward um, because of residue, high residue or high residues of fipronil that has been found in water courses, and I believe that um, that was gen genuinely yes, it's being withdrawn um because um of things like frontline and they believe dogs that have flea treatments going on uh, going on them and then going into water courses rivers and things to, uh, spreading fipronil into the water so it's had quite a knock-on effect and it won't be carried on and that is also one of the reasons why formador is being lost so yeah if you're gonna do it illegally by your it fit for nil now so um you know what it is i feel Sorry. terrible because i've just put an, i've just put an order in for fit for nil for the ants so it'll probably look like i'm going to do that but the next Did you get any? I discuss um yeah i got two boxes of it which will be enough we can use it this summer can't we uh last i think summer. this is the last summer yeah last summer yeah we we love it for ants um absolutely love it for ants but i don't um it's now being found in wax foundation um right and there and there lies the issue doesn't it but i was talking to alex about this and it'll probably be interesting to, yeah i know before my time but in your time you we used to um the pest control industry had wasp pots didn't they which was a base wasp, yeah wasp wasp X, um without boring anybody um yeah we used to mix um iota fenfos um, which actually is an organophosphate insecticide, um, used to be mixed with like a fondant, uh, a, a, a thick sugar syrup that used to go hard and we used to put it in little, for want of a 
it used to be little square boxes with a little opening in it and used to put it all the way around uh, places that attracted wasps, jam factories, food factories, and you put it out at the beginning of the season for queens and workers to feed on. They would then take that back and kill the nest off. That was the idea. I, I understand, you know, there's been a non-targets issue brought up and all that. But when you were saying about wasps are the only things you tend to find in wasp pots, you know, it, it, that is true. Like when wasps get on them, they get on them. But isn't it? Surely they could be deployed if you if you've got Asian hornets coming into your, coming into your apiary site. There's no reason why those those nests those pots can't be put out on a um, on a maintenance basis. So you put them out and watch them. You can't leave them unattended. You know because it's not like rats where they're going to disappear off and they're coming at as jason says if they're landing on it in your hand do you know what i mean like if they're landing on it and eating it like surely there must be that 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 opportunity for us for a product to be um but then again you can't trust people and i absolutely guarantee you one million percent um they're going to take that wasp pot they're going to put it down and then it's going to be like no, there's no one else coming and they're just going to fuck off and leave it on. <laughs> you cannot trust people to um, follow the label, can you, under any circumstances? So, you know, let, well, let's... Been, well, same with that, the Asian hornets. Um, once you attract workers into an Asian hornet trap, they let off a pheromone that attracts further Asian hornets to that trap. So if you've got that product in that trap still, then it's going to keep attracting more and more Asian hornets to it. I got to admit that sounds so dodgy, doesn't it? Fit Pranil custard. That just sounds like. That sounds just. Oh dear, yeah, that just sounds like farm bait mix or something like that. Ah, uh, your farm, your farm mix. What was it? Yeah. Farm mix. Is that what you called it? Farm mix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's another conversation. That's for a another... completely different conversation. I won't have in public. Yeah, farm mix. Yeah, fucking hell. <laughs> You may just get that link all right. So if you, so if people yeah, are interested, find yeah. up that link, register on the website. That gives you all the locations of Asian hornet sightings, nests, um, traps that have been put out. Um, so yeah, it's updated as soon as um, whoever who runs it, um, Simon deals with it. Um, Tony Warren from Gravesend Beekeeping Association. So any information that's put out for him. So all those people. That sign into it as well you can also if you saw, say like sean if you saw an asian hornet you could then put it on there um you can put the traps on there that you've got out so we have an understanding throughout the, the country where there's traps where there's sightings where there's nests where there were nests where nests have been destroyed so instead of relying on information or whatever information the mbu give out those individual people are putting it on there as well um, when sorry, I'm going to say, when is the is this just a rolling thing or not? What do you mean? Is it just a rolling thing? Because when I look at the map, there's nothing for the. I don't think there's. Yeah, I don't think there's anything. Is that Mark getting that wrong? Oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, this is. I got key, you. In that go to location, that key little thing, um, at the end of go to location tab, um, you type in there. Can you see that? Yeah, no, I can see. It, yeah, because there's, there's like, yeah, there's numbers there's, and then there's things. Yeah, so. Mm. Yeah, so you can put type of sighting, a nest, unconfirmed, active, cancelled. Um, so yeah, you can see in your locality what you know nests are around, what traps are around. Um, so yeah, I, I encourage people to put you know sign up to that and just keep an eye on it. You can then keep an eye on what's going on. Um, we'll we'll put that we'll put that link up on the main. I've put it up. I've, I've, I've put it up there. Yeah, yeah. Catch, we'll put catch it up Asian on the, I'll put it up on the Asian Hornet. Um, also, okay, database. Another, another shout to people if they're interested in the southeast in Kent. Um, Simon Spratley, as I said again, is a hosting a meetup at Saltwood Castle Pub on Sunday between one and four. If anyone wants to meet up. Um, He's got traps down there. If people are willing to use um, the guard apis trap, he's got 38 of these 
to lend out to people if they want to use them, put them out in the gardens, acres, whatever. Oops. That's pest control to any, anyone, basically. Do, um, do you have a contact with the manufacturer for that, Jason? I don't. Or can you get us it? it? Can, so can, can you it. get me that? Yeah, yeah, I'll send you a link to it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think um, Clive bought some of these as well, I believe. I can't find the website, Guard Apis. That's it. Um, Guard, so it's guardapis.co.uk. That's G-A-R-D. We're back to mm. hit two hours. Never right. Uh, yeah, we've had you for we've had you for long enough. You come on and you think it's an hour, and then it just flies by, doesn't it? It just absolutely flies by. I sent you a link to that anyway. So yeah, so if you if you anyone's in the in the area and Kent and they're interested, grabbing one of these for a year. Um, yeah, go down there. Um, that was Saltwood Castle Pub on Sunday. Thanks um, for coming on, Jason. No, yeah, thank you're welcome. Very much. Hopefully, um, it's been informative, not too much repeat information. Um, yeah, I hope it's been okay. Um, It'll be interesting, won't it? It's going to be interesting. Um, anyone who wants to see PD, your code's at the bottom. Um, let's see what next week brings. We've got John DeCarter coming on, um, who. He's had, I think he's had a bit of a hard time off pest control, has any? I think he'll tell where he has. Um, I don't think it's a secret. Um, so I want to say thank you to him for him for coming on because really he should probably tell what to do one, but he's not. He's going to come on and he's going to tell us about his dealings with Asian Hornets, which I'm over the moon that he's doing. Thank you very much. Right. Um, yeah. And I'm so we get to hear another these. point of view. Yeah. From the battlefield. Yeah, they're they're swamped, aren't they? You know, they are swamped. So that that will be interesting, and I'm sure there's going to be some stories come out there. So if you are watching, remember to um, subscribe so you don't miss it for next week. Doing that shameless plug, on not you? Yeah. And I also it. want to say, I also want to say another thank you to the UKBR who are sponsoring this. Um, I'm hoping that their sponsorship will come to something positive. He knows what I'm talking about, but I'll bite my tongue until that comes forward. So if you want to know what that what comes as a result of that, please keep watching um, and give a, a subscribe. We want to get up to a, a thousand followers, Thanks. don't we? For the yeah. um, so there's an ability to invite your friends and all that. Please feel free because then the algorithm will start to put it in front of people naturally occurring. We don't have to push it as much. It'll just start putting it in front of the people who will find this content content interesting. So if you could do that for us, it would be a massive help. I think we got like five people, didn't we, to do a group invite, and we jumped yeah. from like three hundred to seven hundred followers. So it is that powerful. So you know, if you want to do it, there's three dots on the page. You click that, and then just group invite, um, and it'll ping them out. So thank you very much for everyone who has stuck with us and bared with us um, and listened to us talk shite for a couple hours um really get appreciate it again next week and alex is back uh, <laughs> oh, how have you got a bbka spring convention next month ukbr ah uh, yeah. yeah yeah tell if any of the beekeepers are watching this please 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 call in at that stand and have a chat with them i know every single one of them and they are a great bunch they are very friendly um and they love talking about bees um, there's a lot of beekeepers as well as pest controllers in that, so you're not going to get pest controlled out. You're going to get bee removaled out. Um, go and have a word with them and see how that goes. Um, I might even come with you, Jason, if I'm invited. If Clive invites us this year. Um, I'll do. Yeah, yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll see. Hmm. Yeah, and we will see. And that, let's see how it goes. Right, th folks. Thank you very much. Um, Jason, Thanks stop on. We'll have a chat with you. God bless. See you soon. All right. Take care. Cheers, Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Beauties and Beasties podcast.